Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome to another one of our webinars. And in this webinar, we're going to be diving into the world of crankshafts and crankshaft selection. And this is a topic that does come up uh, a lot, particularly when people are selecting parts for a new build. Now what we're going to be talking about is the different options that are available out there. We'll talk about the pros and cons of those different examples or different products and talk about why you would want to choose one over another. Uh, this can help you get the right product for your build without uh, potentially wasting money on materials that maybe are far more uh, far stronger than you actually need for your application. Conversely, of course, uh, no one wants to end up with a crankshaft snapping in operation. That normally ends up uh, pretty bad and ends up with a pretty expensive repair on your hands. So making sure that you've got a, a crankshaft that's going to be suitable for your application uh, is going to be pretty important. And this really comes down to a matter of basically weighing up the cost of the uh, crankshaft uh, versus the performance that you need and also the reliability that you want and uh, there's never really too many free lunches when it comes to building performance engines and most often I would say that you do get what you pay for. However, uh, we do also live in a time now where if you are dealing with a late model performance orientated engine, the products that are being put into these engines, at least from the crankshaft standpoint, are pretty damn impressive straight off the showroom floor. Uh, so you can actually do a lot with the stock components before you even need to consider uh, upgrading. Now case in point here, I just want to talk a little bit about my own uh, Mitsubishi 4G63 drag engine. Uh, this is something that uh, we developed for a fairly long time and I'll just uh, try, if I try and get a uh, photo up of this. So if we jump across to my laptop screen here, uh, for anyone who has been following us for a while, I imagine you probably haven't been hiding under a rock and you do have some awareness of this car but for those uh, who haven't this is my old shop car from uh, my uh, last uh, business which was Speed Tech Motorsport or STM and basically we developed this to start out with it was a street legal 10 second car and by the time we retired it it held the world record for the fastest Mitsubishi Evo four wheel drive running as quick as 8.23 at 180 mile an hour and we retired that I want to say probably 11 or 12 years ago now uh, so it hasn't been raced for some time held that record for about three years after we retired and actually only just recently dropped off the 4G63 four-wheel drive top 10 so uh, still pretty potent even though there are much faster cars these days uh, so the engine that was in that in its final iteration we were putting out 1166 wheel horsepower running 54 psi of boost on methanol fuel and uh, re revved to 10 and a half thousand rpm uh, occasionally maybe just a touch over that i think i saw about 11.2 uh, as the maximum revs are ever pulled now with an engine at this level understandably it went through a number of iterations of builds uh, we tried stock crankshafts we moved to expensive billet crankshafts and the reality in that particular case was uh, we actually found that the reliability of the stock mitsubishi crankshaft uh, was arguably just as good as some of the billet crankshafts that we were using at the time. Uh, now that's not to say that every billet crankshaft out there is just the same as a factory Mitsubishi crankshaft. Obviously uh, just because you've got a billet crankshaft that doesn't, that's not the end of the story. There's different materials, there's different finishing processes etc that also affect the reliability. But more the point there is uh, if you are going to go and build a five or 600 horsepower 4G63, uh, do not think that you need to instantly go out and replace the crankshaft with something aftermarket because the factory one's going to fail and that pretty much goes across the board for most late model performance engines that use a factory forged crankshaft. So a little bit of a, a, a side story there uh, but uh, worth mentioning. Uh, now uh, essentially the options that we have out there include cast crankshafts as we'll talk about in a moment it's pretty unlikely these days you'll be dealing with one of those and we'll talk about why uh, and the, the pros and cons shortly uh, then there'll be forged crankshafts the majority of engines that I work with come with a forge crankshaft from factory. We'll talk about pros and cons of those. And then of course uh, we have the option for billet, which is uh, a term that's thrown around a lot these days. And uh, there's a lot of misinformation about what billet is, what it isn't, and as usual, there's some pros and cons involved with that. Uh, 
basically everything really comes down to the budget that you've got available and uh, what your expectations are in terms of power reliability and also RPM ceiling is a big consideration there. All right, so let's go over the three options we've got. We'll start with the cast in, uh, cast crankshaft and uh, essentially again, as I mentioned, uh, unless you're dealing with something that is a fairly old engine, maybe something that is a historic vehicle, the chances of you coming across a factory cast crankshaft are relatively low, low these days. Most manufacturers have moved to producing forgings from the factory. Uh, casting, however, is still something that you may come across so it's worth understanding it and understanding how to identify if you've got a cast crankshaft. Uh, the cast crankshaft process or casting a crankshaft using this process is uh, basically a case of uh, heating up the uh, material uh, cast iron to a point where it's molten and literally pouring it into a uh, mould that is the shape of the crankshaft and then there's obviously going to be some finishing to the crankshaft journals in order to get those to a finished size, make sure everything uh, is turning true and concentric etc. Uh, so from a manufacturer's perspective this is great because it's really cost effective and really fast to produce uh, a crankshaft using the casting process. Uh, however the problem with this, the big issue really is that uh, there is uh, no grain structure essentially within the cast crankshaft so uh, it's it's not a material that's very strong once we've got that finished cast crankshaft. Uh, what this means is that for a performance application when we provide a huge amount of power, uh, cylinder pressure that's applied through the, uh, the conrod uh, into the crankshaft uh, or we spin the engine to very high RPM uh, you are very prone to having a cast crankshaft fail. Uh, if you're lucky you might end up in a situation where the crankshaft breaks maybe at the uh, front or the rear on a main journal and it doesn't destroy your block uh, but it's just as likely that it's going to essentially destroy your entire engine. So cast crankshafts really that's uh, about as much as we need to talk about those but it is worth understanding how to know if you do have a cast crankshaft. So let's jump over to my laptop screen for a moment and uh, because the casting process literally is just pouring the molten material into a mould uh, we do end up with this parting line which is a very sharp line and you'll see that down the crankshaft itself. Uh, on the other hand as you can see here forged crankshaft which we'll talk about next uh, we've got this wider uh, much wider sort of parting line or uh, line on the crankshaft so that is the way of distinguishing between a cast crankshaft uh, and a forged crankshaft and basically all, all components that are cast uh, will share this so if you've got a, a cast iron block uh, you will see parting lines normally on the inside of the engine block which are nice and sharp like this as well uh, consequently that's actually something that when we are prepping the cast iron engine blocks we want to actually remove those because uh, those sharp lines often end up uh, basically breaking material free at high RPM and high load uh, which can obviously go through your oiling system. System. All right, so cast crankshafts done. Don't want them. Get rid of them unless you are building something that makes very low horsepower, very low RPM. And if you are, you're probably in the wrong place if you are watching this lesson. Uh, so next up we have our forged crankshaft. So as I've already said, uh, chances are this is what you're going to see in most late model factory performance engines. And uh, we've got, case in point, I'll just get rid of this billet crank. We'll talk about this one in a second. Uh, so this one here is the crankshaft out of our 4G63 Evo 9 engine. Uh, and if we just turn this over, I'll bring it around to the front here. Basically just, it's a little bit hard to see on our over head uh, but this section here is exactly what we just looked at in that picture uh, we've got this this um cut this wide uh, sort of parting line uh, from the forging process. So how does forging work? Uh, essentially what we do is we take the uh, crankshaft, uh, a piece of material and then we force it into the shape of a crankshaft under intense heat and also intense pressure. The difference between forging a crankshaft like this and casting a crankshaft is that the forging process basically gives us a very fine grain structure in the crankshaft so that grain structure is important to the strength of the crankshaft which is why a forged crankshaft can put up with more uh, power, more cylinder pressure uh, and more RPM than a caster. So those are your main differences there. Now obviously 
not all uh, forged factory crankshafts are made equal. Uh, as I mentioned, obviously the 4G63 crankshaft there, I've personally run these to an excess of a thousand wheel horsepower. Uh, that's not to say that every four cylinder factory forged crankshaft is going to be uh, able to do that. So we do need to understand uh, that a little bit of research into what others are achieving with the factory crankshaft is worthwhile before you you blindly assume that you're going to be absolutely fine. Uh, considerations with this is uh, the material that is used, uh, the design of the crankshaft in terms of the counterweights. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about counterweights shortly. Uh, and also some of the finer details like the way the crankshaft is finished uh, around the fillet radius. So let me just grab the uh, iPhone camera here and we'll just see if we can uh, get a bit of a... Uh, better look at the fillet radius. So it is a little bit hard uh, to see. Now that's probably not where I want to be actually. Let's try this one here, that'll work. Uh, so these fillet radiuses in here, which is where we go, we move from the uh, journal itself that the uh, bearing uh, is supported against with the oil film uh, to the uh, the throw of the crankshaft uh, that's probably or is one of the most highly stressed parts of the crankshaft so this is generally where we're going to start having cracking occur uh, which is the start of the end with our crankshaft uh, so the way this is finished is really important uh, it's a little bit hard to see in this particular image but what we've actually got there is the journal surface which is flat and then we've got a little bit of an undercut so it actually drops down below the surface that the bearing will run against uh, and then we've got this nice radius into the throw of the crankshaft. Uh, that radius is really important to ensure uh, that there aren't there isn't a focus of stress in that point. If we've got a sharp edge you're much more likely to get a stress razor or you will get a stress razor and you're much more likely to have the crankshaft fail there. Uh, so this is just good crankshaft design. Uh, not all OEs do create their crankshafts equally so just inspecting the design of the crankshaft in areas like this does make a bit of a difference in terms of uh, understanding what that crankshaft is likely to be able to do and uh, what it isn't able to do. So pros of the forged crankshaft, grain structure, that's really the main one there. We've got a denser material from that forging process, we've got uh, a material that has a defined grain structure, it's simply going to be stronger. Uh, the downside of the forging process is that it is a uh, more expensive process, it's more time consuming, it takes more energy to produce a crankshaft in this manner compared to casting. So your overall finished product is going to be uh, more expensive. Uh, in comparison to our next option as well, uh, forging isn't something that uh, would be used for a one-off crank design or a very low run crankshaft uh, volume. So that's, uh, that's another consideration there. Uh, if you're looking for something uh, pretty unique, maybe you want a crankshaft with some, some uh, spe sorry, specifications that are available off the shelf, then uh, forging is certainly not something that you're going to be able to get a custom crankshaft made, uh, that's pretty unlikely. The third option that we've got is a billet crankshaft and again there's a lot of misunderstanding about what billet is and what it isn't, the pros and cons of uh, billet material and the limitations. So most people think that billet because we hear that term thrown around so much uh, must be the best, it must be superior. And yes it can be but there are actually some drawbacks compared to the likes of a forged crankshaft and really again this comes down to the grain structure. So let me just get the uh, billet crankshaft back under our overhead and we'll have a look at a few of the aspects of it. Uh, probably actually a little bit tighter on that overhead than we need to be but uh, you'll get the idea here. So this is a manly stroker crankshaft for our 4G63. That'll probably give you a pretty good idea of what's going on in here. Um, so the the reason we went this this path was because uh, we wanted a crankshaft that isn't actually available in fact uh, from the factory in this stroke. So uh, this is a 94 millimeter stroke crankshaft. Factory 4G63 crank is 88 millimeter. You can use the 64 crankshaft, which is 100 millimeter, giving either 2.0 or 2.3 liter. Uh, I don't personally, I'm not a huge fan of the 100 mil stroke for an engine that I want to rev. So I've personally had really good results with the 80, uh, the 94 millimeter stroke crank. It's a nice improvement in capacity and bottom end torque plus 
uh, the ability to spool the larger turbo compared to the two litre are uh, still uh, easily capable of revving to eight or 9,000 RPM in a street engine. Uh, we've run these crankshafts in 2.2 litre uh, engines to in excess of 10,500 RPM in some of our drag engines as well. So anyway, back to our overhead here. Uh, the first thing that's really clear is uh, these nice, smooth, fully machined uh, counter weights or balance counterbalances on the crankshaft uh, and while it's not that easy to see from our overhead uh, the other aspect of this is there is no parting line uh, we've got our sharp cast parting line we've got our wider parting line from the forging process we don't have any of that so uh, that's the identifier of a billet crankshaft we do need to be a little bit careful here because some crankshaft manufacturers actually do take a forging and then basically do a finished machining process. So uh, you can end up with a forged crankshaft that looks a little bit like this, but that is much less common. Uh, so the billet crankshaft is essentially produced from, as its name implies, a billet of the correct steel or material. Normally these are made out of uh, 4340, but there are other materials that are used as well. Uh, and that billet just starts as a large round uh, cylinder of the material. It's put into a lathe and essentially it is machined into the finished form of a crankshaft. As you can understand, uh, that's going to be really time consuming, uh, particularly with the uh, Conrad throws uh, the there's a lot of material that needs to be machined off this uh, these days with CNC machining uh, I'm not a machinist myself but I can only imagine that uh, the uh, the ease of producing a crankshaft that looks like this has become much uh, simpler uh, but still there is a lot of work that goes into this so uh, the downside of the uh, billet crankshaft is basically twofold the time uh, required to produce it the amount of material that is wasted and then the part that's so easy to overlook is because uh, while we are starting with a superior piece of material compared to a casting, definitely it's nothing like a, a casting in terms of grain structure. That billet does have a, a, a nice uh, strong grain structure in itself, but uh, we're basically cutting through this, we're machining through that billet and turning it into something that looks like a crankshaft. So we don't actually have the grain structure uh, flowing in the shape of the crank throws and the journals like we do uh, with our forging. So all things being equal, and it would be impossible to have uh, the two crankshafts absolutely equal, uh, the forged crankshaft does still have a superior grain structure. So that's a consideration there. Uh, the upside of the billet crankshaft is that we can produce crankshafts that just aren't financially viable to do in small runs uh, using the forging process anyway. So the, 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 the material strength and the materials available uh, basically go a long way to making the issue of grain structure much less significant than when we look at uh, cast versus a uh, forged crankshaft in the first place. Uh, now there are other aspects to this as well, just uh, not strictly uh, about the the crankshaft um, manufacturing process, but in terms of producing a crankshaft that is suitable for a performance application. Uh, what we can see here if we go to our overhead is uh, that the oil galleries that are drilled through the crankshaft here, uh, basically to link the uh, oil feeds for the big end journals so that we can get oil supply to those uh, bearings. Uh, we've got to get that oil supply from the main journal which is where it's supplied into the crankshaft in the first place through the oil galleries. Long story short basically we need to get that oil from the, the block into the crankshaft and then from the crankshaft up to the big ends. Uh, but the problem is that when we do a strip down and we clean everything we really want to be able to get access to those galleries. So uh, in this application here uh, Manly who produced this crankshaft have basically drilled and tapped the crankshaft for little uh, plugs there so these are a uh, tapered plug, thread plug, that uh, we can remove to fully clean the crankshaft. So that's a really nice feature. Uh, if I just swap over to our stock 4G63 crank, uh, let's see, we can see that in stock form, and this is pretty common, uh, basically we've got a ball bearing that is pressed into location after the crankshaft has been machined and then that's pinged over. The problem with this is that uh, it's very difficult to remove that. Uh, the process I've used in the past is to have those ball bearings spark eroded. Uh, it's stainless so trying to drill it out will be absolutely hopeless. Uh, so having it spark eroded is the only way i found to reliably and quickly get them out. After that of course you can 
can then uh, drill and tap the crankshaft for a pressure plug yourself. Uh, but it is a consideration, particularly if you've got a used crankshaft. We really want to be able to make sure that we don't have any material trapped in behind there, particularly if the crankshaft or the engine has suffered some problem and uh, there's been debris that has been thrown around inside of the engine. We want to make sure that that doesn't get trapped up in there and get released while the engine is running. So those are uh, our main issues there and the distinction between uh, the forged and the billet crankshafts. Uh, as I mentioned there are also material considerations though. So uh, I mentioned that the majority of the uh, billet crankshafts that we come across will usually be made out of a 4340 material uh, which for most instances is going to be absolutely fine. Uh, last year when we were at uh, Sydney Jamboree I ended up talking to Jim from Nitto Performance Engineering uh, over there. Nitto very well known for producing rotating assemblies for a fairly wide range of engines but uh, probably quite famous for uh, the pr products that they're producing for the RB26. Uh, they've got engines that are producing somewhere in the region of 2,500 plus wheel horsepower uh, running deep into the sixes now. And what they found is at that sort of power level, once they're up over sort of 2,000 plus wheel horsepower, uh, the 4340 material uh, was not strong enough. It didn't have the rigidity that it needed. And what we get with these crankshafts is while uh, they look like they're really nice and stiff and rigid while it's sitting there on the workbench, uh, you do get to a situation where at very high cylinder pressures and high RPM, uh, the whole crankshaft is flexing. And if we get enough flex, first of all, over time, it's going to end up resulting in the crankshaft failing, it's going to end up cracking and failing. Uh, but we also run into more immediate pressing problems with the crankshaft uh, flexing to the point where we get metal to metal contact between the crankshaft journals and the bearings. That's going to result in very fast catastrophic failure. So we need to stay away from that, understandably. Uh, I forget the exact specification. I think it was EN40B that, uh, that Nitto went to. They basically made a higher spec crankshaft for the handful of people pushing these engines uh, that hard sort of two and a half thousand plus horsepower and in their initial testing I believe that that product was relatively new back uh, beginning of 2020 uh, it had they had done a few teardowns and uh, was showing really promising signs that the improved material had also fixed that problem that they were having the problem with this, and again, it comes down to just understanding the requirements for your application. If you were to go to this N40B material, understandably, that's going to be a significant increase in in uh, expense compared to a 4340 crankshaft uh, and if you are making a thousand wheel horsepower it simply wouldn't be justifiable so this is where really understanding your requirements understanding what's available and the implications of that uh, for your application is so important uh, right we're going to get into some questions really shortly so probably a good time to mention if you do have any questions please ask them we do have a few uh, more aspects to cover. Uh, now not strictly related to our uh, material our material selection here but uh, it's important to also talk about the hardening process that is used on a crankshaft. So the material while the, 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 the materials that crankshafts are made out of is relatively hard anyway uh, most ma crankshaft manufacturers OE and aftermarket go a little bit further to providing uh, a further hardened surface for the crankshaft journals. Uh, the two processes in the aftermarket for a performance crankshaft uh, we typically use gas nitriding uh, which is a process that a lot of heat treating companies will be able to produce to do for you. Uh, the crankshaft is heated up in a uh, gas that includes a number of chemical elements. I'm not a chemist so I can't tell you exactly uh, what is involved with that but basically those infuse into the surface of the crankshaft and provide a very hard surface. The reason that this is important is that it just provides a little bit more long-term reliability for the journal. Uh, if there does end up being a small amount of debris uh, that passes through the oil which even in the best of cases is up often unavoidable, uh, it's not going to end up scoring the crankshaft and rendering it useless. Normally the debris in turn will actually end up getting embedded into the bearing material where it will stay. So uh, the hardened surface is quite important from a long term wear perspective, not strictly speaking from a strength
strength perspective. Uh, the other option for surface hardening is induction hardening, which is much more likely to see what we see with a factory crankshaft, which is where uh, the crankshaft is it goes through a process called understandably induction hardening uh, which uh, basically produces a localized hard surface on the crankshaft uh, journals. The problem with these two uh, options here is just understanding how thick that uh, surface hardening is. Uh, the difference between induction hardening and gas nitriding uh, will produce a different thickness of that hardened surface. Uh, also, how the uh, gas nitriding process is taken out will also dictate how, how far into the crankshaft surface uh, the, the hardened surface will go through. But the key point to take away here is that if you get to a situation where the crankshaft does need to be ground to undersize on any of the journals, uh, then chances are that that's going to grind through the hardened surface because it is very, very thin and you're going to end up with an unhardened surface. So what are your options there? Uh, so in the past I have gone through the process of having a crankshaft gas nitrided to re-harden it. Uh, I personally haven't had great results from this. Uh, the reason for this is because of the temperatures uh, that are used for the gas nitriding process, uh, more often than not I end up with a crankshaft that has moved slightly and basically essentially ends up with a very minor bend in it. Now this can usually be corrected but it, it doesn't really sort of give me uh, a, a huge amount of confidence in the process when uh, 9 times out of 10 I find that the crankshaft will be slightly bent as a result. Obviously we don't want a bent crankshaft. Uh, so the other option is you can do nothing at all which sounds a little bit uh, scary and I know a lot of people uh, ask me about this in our webinars, uh, can we uh, do is this a problem if the crankshaft is uh, running and it's not a hardened surface? Uh, the reality is that if you were running a road car engine and you wanted 100 plus thousand miles before uh, your next overhaul, uh, probably not. But for a race application where our engines are getting torn down and rebuilt regularly, uh, I actually haven't found uh, that much of a significant impact from uh, not having the surface rehardened. So uh, basically, we're seeing the 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 ultimate runtime of the crankshaft is going to be much shorter usually anyway and we're seeing it regularly enough that we can pick up on any uh, undue uh, wear before it actually becomes a problem. Uh, the next question that sort of comes up as part of this is will uh, an unhardened crankshaft surface like this affect the strength? Uh, in my own experience I haven't seen any detrimental impact to the crankshaft strength from uh, grinding the crankshaft and running it in an unhardened state. Uh, it's not so much a case of strength, it's more just a case of reliability. Uh, now the other thing I also wanted to talk about, and this is more uh, due specifically down to uh, the 4G63 here, and one of the things that is always worth keeping an eye on with these 4G63s during a teardown, uh, this is more of a case, it's an issue on the earlier 7 bolt 4G63 crankshafts, uh, where they ran a one piece centre main bearing that incorporated the thrust collars. Uh, from the the Evo 5 onwards uh, they went to a separate thrust washers uh, and that seemed to fix the problem but on the earlier 4G63s uh, there's very well known issues with uh, what was called crank walk. So let me just get in here, I'll see if I can uh, get this located in a place where I can uh, show you. So what we're interested in here during a teardown on a 4G63 yeah I think that'll do it, is inspecting this thrust surface of the crankshaft here. Uh, now in this case we do need to consider whether the crankshaft uses a push type clutch in which case uh, this is the surface we'd want to look at. Uh, pointing in this direction, this is the rear of the crankshaft, so uh, when the clutch is depressed by the driver's foot, it basically tries to force the crankshaft towards the front of the engine. Uh, so this surface here runs against the thrust bearing uh, inside, or the thrust washer inside the engine, and what we're looking for during a teardown of these engines is just to make sure that that surface is 
perfectly smooth and perfectly flat. Uh, essentially you shouldn't have any scratching or scoring uh, that you can see uh, or anything that you can feel with your fingernail. On those earlier 7 bolt engines that were starting to suffer from uh, crank walk or thrust bearing failure, uh, you'd quite, quite often see uh, a very obvious sign that the crankshaft surface, that thrust surface was severely worn and there'd be quite a deep ridge gouged into that. Often this would also be visible on the thrust bearing itself. So that's just something, uh, and it really goes for all engines, it's just good, common, good practice to basically have a thorough examination of the components as you pull them out and uh, make sure that uh, there's nothing sort of obviously wrong there that you do uh, need to correct. The reason I say this is so often we can overlook that at the start and then uh, if we get to a point where the engine's all back together and we haven't picked up that problem still and we haven't picked up the fact we've got excessive thrust clearance, uh, we're going to end up with an expensive freshly built engine uh, that is unfortunately destined to suffer a very short life and a fairly expensive failure. Uh, even if we get to a point where we pick this up during final assembly, which we definitely should, uh, we're going to be in a situation where we're then going to need to fix it, which is going to waste further time, particularly if you need uh, to rely on your machinist. So always a good idea uh, just to thoroughly inspect all of your components. We're obviously focusing on the crankshaft today, but this really goes for everything you pull out of the engine and pick up on any little hints of a problem there and then rather than finding them uh, during the final assembly where as I say it's going to waste a lot of time. Uh, now the other aspect I just want to talk about here is uh, crankshaft bearing or bearing selection in general and how we can go about this. Uh, now actually I'll start with this crankshaft that I've just moved out of the way. Uh, now there's a variety of different ways that we can choose our crankshaft bearings. I'm just trying to figure out if that's going to show up on our overhead and it isn't. <coughs> um, and a lot of factory uh, engines actually use essentially a a uh, blueprinting process. I'm just trying to align this so we can actually see what I want to talk about here. I think that'll work. Let's make sure that the iPhone is not going to fall off. Uh, I do apologise, it is a little bit tricky to see but uh, on these two parts of the crankshaft, you know, if we look at our iPhone camera, uh, we can see that there are a set of numbers that are stamped into the crankshaft. In this case we've got 22122 and then we've got 2222. So these numbers here relate to the uh, outside crankshaft, outside di diameter of the main journal on the crankshaft. Uh, these ones here relate to the outside diameter on the big end journals of the crankshaft. So this is kind of a factory blueprinting technique. Uh, on the block and on the conrods we'll also find numbers stamped and basically when the crankshaft goes through final inspection at the plant basically all of the dimensions are measured and depending exactly where they are in the tolerance range uh, that will define whether it's a 1, 2 or a 3 uh, stamped onto that crankshaft likewise uh, the engine block and the conrod. So what this means is that then <coughs> Excuse me. We can use that data to help decide what grade of bearing or what identification number on the bearing we should have. If we get all of this right, this should give us the factory uh, oil clearances that Mitsubishi specify. So, a couple of things about this. One, that's going to be great if we do want Mitsubishi's recommended oil clearance. We may not, particularly if we're building an engine to make a lot more power, rev a lot higher. Uh, generally, my preference is to build the engine a little bit looser uh, than the factory tolerances. Uh, the other part though is first of all if we've got a second hand crankshaft that's unknown origins and it's done some mileage, uh, well we don't necessarily know that those sizes uh, for the journals are accurate anymore. And of course if we've moved to aftermarket components like our crankshaft here, uh, well, we've got no markings on that. So what do we do? Well if we jump across to my laptop screen for a moment, uh, we'll see here, I'll just zoom in a little bit, uh, this is out of the factory Mitsubishi workshop manual for the 4G63 Evo 9 and you'll get this with any factory workshop manual, obviously I'm focusing on the Evo 9 here but this is one, just one of the reasons why it's so important to get a copy of your factory workshop manual before you start building your engine and uh, basically what we've got here is these identification marks that I just mentioned, zero, one and two for the crankshaft journal outside diameter. Uh, likewise we've got the cylinder block 
bearing bore, that's what they've called it here, and the identification mark on that, which is again a 0, 1 or a 2. So the important part here is it actually lists the size in both millimetres and inches for each of those identification marks. In other words, here for the, our, our top one, for an identification mark 0, that crankshaft journal size must be between 56.994 millimetres and 57.000 millimetres. So obviously, if we have this information, and armed with our trusty micrometer, we can replicate these measurements on our aftermarket crankshaft or our used factory crankshaft and just confirm before we go any further that yes, in fact, it is still on that identification mark size or with our new crankshaft, find out where it actually fits in that range. We can do exactly the same with our block uh, or our Conrod bearing journal. Uh, using our micrometer and a dial bore gauge and basically uh, reverse those those measurements back and then uh, using this grid here it tells us for example here if we are dealing with a identification mark one on our crankshaft and we are zero on our cylinder block we should be using a crankshaft bearing with an identification mark one. Uh, different engines do this in a slightly different way or different factory workshop manuals do this in a slightly different way but essentially this is the factory way of blueprinting the oil clearances and getting them where they want it to be. Uh, conversely uh, if you know what the factory uh, oil clearance is uh, you can then manipulate the factory bearing grade or identification mark that you're using uh, to adjust your oil clearance and get it to where you want it to be uh, once you know what the crankshaft journal diameter and the uh, the, crank, the Conrod uh, bore diameter or the uh, engine block bore diameter is, you can basically manipulate those numbers to suit yourself. Uh, right, I think we'll move into some questions now, that's probably enough talking from me, we'll see what we've got, if you've got any more, let keep them coming. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, first question comes from Jax, uh, who's asked, where's a good place to buy a new crankshaft? Ah, uh, Jax, that's a, a pretty difficult question for me to answer because a lot of this is going to come down to whereabouts in the world you are. Um, there are obviously the big companies like Summit and Jigs that will supply just about anything you can imagine for a popular performance engine. Uh, we deal with a local company here in New Zealand that sources a lot of the components out of the US uh, like the Manly crankshaft we've got. But so much of it is going to come down to where you are in the world and, and specifically what brand uh, you're looking for. A, a good way to start if you've got uh, your eye on a particular brand would be to reach out to the sales department of that company and ask them if they have uh, local dealers in your area. That's probably what I'd suggest. Uh, so here's asked uh, when we reduce the weight of the crankshaft it spins up quickly but it can bog down easy but beyond a certain limit uh, so if we go by this it needs lighter pistons and a conrod to offset the reduced counterweight in order to maintain balance uh, how do we know whether the used piston and conrod weights are ideal for a lighter crankshaft for a street and weekend track car can you suggest machining process which can be done on the crankshaft to gain some performance without sacrificing reliability okay so uh, this is probably something I actually should have uh, included inside of this webinar uh, there's a bit of a problem with what you've said there uh, because it can be accurate but it depends very much on the type of engine that you're dealing with. So if we've got let's say an inline four cylinder or six cylinder engine, the weight of the pistons and the conrods actually has no impact whatsoever on the balance of the crankshaft. That's because when, for our, in our case, our four cylinder crankshaft, uh, we've got number two and number three piston and conrod at top dead centre, we've got number one and number four at bottom dead centre. So the piston and conrod weights actually cancel each other out. So when we're dealing with the balancing of these crankshafts, uh, we basically balance the crankshaft, the front pulley, usually I'll include the flywheel and the clutch pressure plate and uh, we balance that as one assembly or actually we leave this to our machinists because it requires some specialist equipment to do so. Once we've done that we can then balance the connecting rods and the pistons but we're balancing them just to each other essentially what I mean is we want all of our pistons to weigh within whatever our tolerance is let's say half a gram or whatever we decide that's going to be likewise our conrod big end and little end weights will also be balanced to whatever our desired tolerance is so that's for an inline engine. Uh, if we're dealing with a V configuration engine now things get a little bit different here and we do need to be pr quite careful. Uh, with these engines the 
weight of the piston, the con rod, uh, the ring pack, they even take into account the bearing weight and the weight or some estimate of weight for the oil film that's going to be on those components. That will actually be calculated by the engine machinist and that will be used to build what is called or uh, calculate what is called a bob weight which is a physical weight which is connected or attached to the big end journal of the crankshaft during the balancing process so very different ways of balancing those two styles of crankshaft uh, now so with the the v configuration the engine we do need to be mindful because uh, yes we can get ourselves into a situation where the crankshaft is actually underweight for or well, the crankshaft counterweights are underweight for the mass of our piston and rod assemblies uh, and that's a pretty expensive process because the machinist needs to uh, drill and insert uh, slugs of heavy metal such as mallory into the crankshaft counterweights in order to balance that out. A uh, really important with a V configuration engine that you are using uh, known components that work together or are matched. A good example of this with our GM LS1 stroker engine, uh, we used a complete rotating assembly from K1 Technologies. Uh, so that included the crankshaft, it included the con rods and a set of pistons. And basically those are all developed to work together, meaning that the balancing process of the crankshaft, we were pretty confident we weren't going to get ourselves into any uh, sticky situations when we got that far. So hopefully that explains that. Uh, your question on what can we, uh, you also mentioned about uh, reducing the weight of the crankshaft. So there's two aspects here. Yes, uh, a lightweight crankshaft will reduce the rotating inertia, allowing the engine to uh, accelerate quicker. So yep, that's, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, there are situations where this isn't desirable though, so particularly with our drag engine builds, uh, we actually purposely kept uh, quite a heavy flywheel and the reason for this is the additional inertia from that heavy flywheel actually can help the car get out of the hole during the launch, uh, whereas if you have a very light flywheel uh, and a very light crankshaft and rotating assembly, when you drop the clutch, there isn't a lot to keep everything going, so if you're just on the edge and the wrong side of that edge, it can be very easy to end up with the engine bogging down so again it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve uh, particularly going very light on your rotating assembly for a street driven car uh, where you're stopping and starting taking off from intersections and traffic lights all the time uh, can actually be really annoying uh, to, to drive so a little bit of extra inertia there can be beneficial flip side of this if we've got a dedicated competition car particularly one maybe with a paddle shifted gearbox where uh, the transient response of the engine on a throttle blip for a downshift is really important to allow the, the speed of the shift to uh, be, be maintained. Uh, lightweight really is the key there. What can you do in a machining process on the crank to gain some performance? Uh, really not a lot. Uh, there, there is pr some processing around uh, knife edging the crankshaft I personally haven't seen measurable gains from that. Knife edging the crankshaft is simply, as its name implies, sharpening or uh, profiling the counterweights of the crankshaft in order to help it cut through the oil film in the uh, crankcase, uh, reducing windage losses. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're getting down into the nitty gritty of sort of the, the last few percent of horsepower there, or probably last few horsepower full stop. Uh, Bjorn has asked, uh, besides how to select the crankshaft, what about the things to look out for where rods and bearings are concerned on the crankshaft? Uh, what sort of in play are the conrods expected and what to look out for? Okay, so these sort of really come down to more uh, just mainstream standard things that we're going to be looking for with uh, the, the engine during assembly. Uh, and it's not just a crankshaft thing. If you're using a set of aftermarket rods, I have had the odd occasion where uh, the side clearance on the conrod wasn't sufficient. So uh, side clearance on the conrod is not that critical. It's not like our other clearances. Generally, uh, somewhere in the region of about 8 to 10 thou would be pretty typical. But uh, you again, you'll have that specific in your factory workshop manual so definitely it's something that you need to check. The uh, only other thing with the aftermarket crankshaft that uh, I did mention uh, that you will want to look out for is the radius and the undercut there. Uh, that radius is so important for the long term reliability of the crankshaft. Uh, so he has asked is there a way to fix a slightly bent crankshaft what would be the symptoms of a bent crank is if it's unnoticed by the driver and the cars continue to be driven uh, depending on how bent the crankshaft is yes it can be uh, it can be straightened uh, this isn't normally uh, a job you do at home relies on or requires a hydraulic press and some v-blocks to support the crankshaft so uh, most 
uh, machine shops will be able to do this for you depending again how bent the crankshaft is uh, you're probably not going to notice this uh, if it's really bent you're going to have problems with bearing wear in which case the rest of the engine is probably going to end up being destroyed including the crankshaft anyway uh, but a minor bend could be noticeable by wear patterns on the bearings when the engine is disassembled uh, a general uh, process of machining is always to check the crankshaft that it is straight uh, during during the machining work anyway so we're always looking for that uh, Bjorn's asked uh, when it, where it comes to polishing a crankshaft that spun a bearing would you determine how much uh, is too far gone to repair okay uh, I reckon probably in my uh, career I've seen about maybe one in five maybe one in eight crankshafts that's had a very light run bearing uh, was recoverable uh, it'll never be recoverable by uh, I won't say never, very unlikely that you'd recover this by polishing the journal. Uh, almost always you're going to find that there'll be enough material transferred or onto the crankshaft journal or away from the crankshaft journal that it will require a grind to undersize to uh, recover that. Uh, the bigger problem though is that the friction involved when uh, we have a bearing problem like this, uh, in my experience, almost always you're going to end up with a crankshaft bent as well and it does get into a situation where sometimes it is just cheaper to throw the crankshaft out and either source a second hand good, good condition unit uh, or buy a brand new one particularly if you're dealing with a popular engine uh, like the 4G63 here back when I was building these uh, we normally had six or eight good crankshafts that were on the shelf at any time that were pulled out of engines where we fitted stroker crankshafts for example and for a few hundred dollars you could probably pick one of those up second hand uh, it's going to be a perfectly good starting point uh, compared to the money that you'd pour into trying to recover uh, a damaged crankshaft with your machinist it, it's just sometimes doesn't make sense uh, Dusty's asked I've seen some people chamfering oil ports for better oil flow across the bearing surfaces is it worth it or is it too much of a risk in terms of compromising the crankshaft uh, no actually Dusty that's probably again something that I should have dealt with uh, so this is something that can be done uh, personally I would leave this to your machinist if you do want to do this the reason for this really comes down to the problem that that surface as I mentioned is really really hard uh, so if you think you're going to be able to get in there with your die grinder and uh, do a good job of chamfering those oil holes where they come out uh, onto the the crankshaft journal uh, you're probably going to be quite surprised just how hard it is to remove that material the bigger risk there also comes into if you end up uh, slipping and skipping across the crankshaft journal surface uh, you can very easily damage it but yeah basically the uh, the chamfering or basically turning that oil hole into an ellipse rather than just a circle is just designed around improving the oil flow and how it comes out of that hole uh, and reaches the bearing. Uh, Sirius has asked, uh, why do usually machinists recommend an oversized bearing when we recover a crankshaft from light damage? Um, because if the crankshaft has been recovered from light damage, uh, that would normally entail the crankshaft being ground to undersize. Uh, so what that is is exactly what it sounds like. The crankshaft journals where they are damaged to get back to fresh material to give a nice surface finish uh, that the bearings can run against, uh, the machinist will actually remove material. So this needs to to be done uh, with an oversized or thicker bearing shell so that your oil clearance remains where it needs to be. Uh, Bjorn's also said speaking of thrust washers and crank walk uh, how much end play would you consider to be acceptable back to the back and forth thrust measurement via a dial gauge uh, to check the amount of play uh, so again this is something that really needs to be sourced from your workshop manual uh, just like I said with the uh, the in, in play or side play or side clearance I should say with the uh, Conrod uh, this is not a super critical clearance so there's going to be a wider range that will be acceptable with uh, crankshaft thrust or end float uh, compared to the likes of the main bearing or crankshaft uh, big end bearing oil clearances somewhere in the region of probably eight to ten thousandths of an inch would be pretty typical uh, and there'll be a wider clearance as a, a wider tolerance range as I mentioned but uh, again you, you really need to start with your factory workshop manual uh, in order to figure out what the factory think is acceptable <laughs> 
work from there every engine is different right uh, that brings us to the end of those questions so remember if you are watching this in our archive and you've got any further questions please uh, feel free to ask those in the forum and I'll be happy to answer them there uh, thanks for joining us and hopefully we can see you next time that was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. Our Gold members are able to watch these live and ask questions and get answers while we're presenting. After the webinars have been hosted live, they're added into our webinar archive where our Gold members can re-watch them at their leisure. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. This is one of the fastest ways to expand your knowledge on a wide range of topics as well as to stay up to date with the latest tools, trends and techniques in the performance industry. Our Gold members also get access to our private members only forum which is the best place to get fast answers to your specific questions. Gold membership can be purchased for just 19 US dollars per month, however you'll also receive 3 months of free access with the purchase of any of our courses. Click the link in the description to learn more.